Welcome back to another lecture for pre-calculus. Today's lecture is on section 2.1, functions. This is really going to be a sort of a, a, a 10,000 foot lecture on some specifics, uh, maybe just some of the details of what a function is. Uh, but then there's going to be a lot of a lot of examples of what kinds of things are functions. And a lot of these things we're, we're just not going to get into the details of. Uh, they're either too complicated to write as a strict mathematical or precise mathematical function, uh, or they can only be represented with a set of statistics or a set of data. So uh, here we go. 2.1 functions. Functions really are all over the place. Uh, you, you, you recognize them at a probably instinctive level. At an, ins at an ins instinctive level. Um, there are lots of things that you know uh, are functions, such as, right, your height, the height of a person, or let me just say the height of an, uh, an organism, is a function of its age. If you want to know how tall a given person is, a good guess at that age would be, or sorry, a good guess at that height is to look at how old they are, right? You could guess a child's height maybe by just knowing its age. Uh, a zero year old is probably close to 20 inches long. A, on the other hand, 21 year old is probably close to five or six feet tall. Right, the height of a person, or maybe even just organisms in general, uh, it's a function of its age. You take the input of the age, and you have a good estimate or a good guess as to the height. Temperature. How hot it is outside it is a function. of time. I'm going to say time here, but we could we could make this just a little more specific. I could say time of day, right? Right now, we're, it's it's what is it? February 18th, and uh, there's a question of what's the temperature outside. Well, it's also 3:30 in the afternoon on February 18th. It's probably warmer now than it will be in four hours when it is 7:30 at night. The temperature falls as the time of the day goes on. The temperature also falls as we go through this winter time. And as summer comes around, in July 18th, for example, we would expect that the temperature outside will be much higher. Temperature is a function of time. You, you, you plug in some time, maybe of the day or maybe of the year, and you get out a good estimate for the temperature of that time or the temperature of that day. Okay, now I'm talking about sort of imprecise things here because these are <laughs> just great examples, representations of functions all around us. Uh, mathematical functions have a very specific meaning, which I'll get to here in a second, but a mathematical function is just a formalization of these things that we recognize all the time, right, all around us. Uh, a function has some input and then some output right in real life these things are like you know how much money you put into something how much time you put into something how much effort you put into something dictates how much of the enjoyment or how much of the uh, benefits or how much of the uh, relationship or whatever what have you whatever you put in determines how much you get out and when that is a very very well defined thing the more precise it is then it becomes easier to put a nice 
strict, precise mathematical rule to it, but it, but in the real world, a function just takes an input and gives you an output. Okay. So let's cut to the mathematical and precise formal definition, which still I'm going to leave this this drawing up here. A function. And I'm going to use a letter here, f, a function f. So f is like the name to this function. It's uh, maybe like the nickname. Okay, it's just the, a single letter. So it's it's like, you know, in Stranger Things, they call her L. It's a single letter. That's okay. We're going to use one letter to represent this function f. And a function f is a rule which assigns or which gives each input, I'm going to use the word input, x to exactly 1 output. And I'm going to call that with the variable y. But this y that I'm writing because that's what you're familiar with, I'm going to show you another way of writing that here. So y is the result of the function. So I'm going to list this f parentheses with an x inside it. Okay, you can imagine that functions sort of have like a, a bag that they carry around with them or some sort of like machine that they have and the input gets placed inside there. The result is the whole thing. You know, this whole, this symbol here, F with parentheses around an X means F is doing something to X and the output is the whole thing, F of x. We could say that it's a specific number, so we say it's equal to a variable. Um, but this is the general notation for functions. Okay. But before I get into that, again, on this definition, this is an important thing. Each input is assigned, is linked, is, is uh, dedicated to exactly one output. Okay? That's huge. When I uh, you know, go to start my car in the morning, I put my key in and I turn it. I'm providing an input, right? So turn the key and I expect one thing to happen, <laughs> okay? The car tries to start. Now, of course, the car can't try, but it starts a process. When I turn that key, it starts a process to try and ignite the gasoline in the engine to get the whole thing up and running. This is what I expect. It doesn't always start, but, but it, it tries. <laughs> it tries its best. There's only one possibility for this. There's only one thing that happens when I turn the key. Okay? If my computer shuts off at the same time, right? Or there's a chance of either of these things happening, I should say. You don't know which, but one of them could happen. That's not a function. You see, there's two possible answers. An input is now linked to two possible outputs. That's a terrible thing, right? Uh, maybe it's a good thing if you're leaving the house and you want your computer off, so you keep turning the key over and over again <laughs> until the computer shuts off. But uh, a function for each input has only one output linked to it. Okay? Okay. So, games of chance where you're rolling a dice, uh, uh, the number, right, is not a function of 
rolling the dice. Right, you roll the dice, that's your input. A number comes out, but there's so many different possible numbers. That number that comes out, it is an artifact of chance. It is not a, it is not a function of you rolling the dice. We can talk about more things like this in a statistics class or a probability class because there's some sort of relation there, uh, but it, we're not going to call it a function. A function specifically has this definition. Okay, so I'm going to now real quickly talk about the anatomy of functions and function notations. Okay, so I've already listed what the notation is. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger now because you don't always deal with functions of one variable. So first, this is the name or the symbol associated with the function. Here in this first example, I'm using f because that's just the first letter of the word function. This is a very general function. But if you know something about the function, maybe it's maybe it's cost, the cost of something, well then you're probably going to call this c. Uh, maybe it's height, so you're going to use an h. Or maybe what you're trying to describe it's something so abstract, like like only, or maybe it's something that's only only so many people would actually enjoy it, or do it, or know what you're talking about. So instead of using a single letter, you actually use something like, like uh, uh, a word. Okay, so maybe this is like the interest. So this literal word is the name and the symbol associated to the function. That means it is the thing that describes that specific linkage, that specific assignment of one thing to the next. Okay, But just generally, I'm going to say f here, because we're dealing with a general function. These parentheses, they're not used to describe an ordered pair, like a, an xy coordinate. They're not used to represent uh, uh, this group of things multiplied by an f. These parentheses are just grouping together a list. So these parentheses just group a list. Just grouping symbols. for a list, dot, 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 a list of what? I'm trying to find a better color here. A list, dot, 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 of inputs. So everything that's listed here, no matter how many things they are, it's just a list of inputs. I gave the example of height earlier today. And so a very good, perhaps a, perhaps a better function th than what I said earlier. I said height is a function of age. P but perhaps a better function would be if you plug in the age. So y I ask you how tall somebody is, and you ask me, well, how old are they? And you also ask, uh, what's, their, what's their sex, right? boy, girl, right? Maybe you even ask, well, oh, genetic things like, uh, is their family tall? So family history. <laughs> My family has a bunch of people in it that are over six feet tall. And wouldn't you guess, I'm six feet tall. So no matter how many inputs you get to describe that height function, you can just list all of those here. Usually they're divided up with commas, um, but it's just the set of inputs. And all of those inputs are going to help you determine the height. Okay?
All right. So I think that's pretty good, a pretty good description of functions. I hope that makes sense to you. The inputs, another name for them is the R, is the independent variables. Okay. All right. These are the things that are independent. They're, what are they independent of? Well, they're, they're sort of independent because you have the ability to choose them or you have the ability to plug them in. The outputs, we call these the dependent variables or the dependent. Dependent, you're just making sure it's spelling right. We say it's dependent because it depends on what you plug in. Right, that height function earlier, if I tell you the age is 0 or the age is 50, what you say as your expected height or guess for a height is going to be different depending on what I or you know, depending on the inputs. So we usually we can call these things more or less the, the same, right? So the inputs are the independent variables and the output is a dependent variable. Um, all right, so a couple other things here about functions. We've talked about this one. The set of all possible inputs, possible or allowed, is called or is the We've done this one before. If I gave you a, a numerical function like y equals 2x plus 1, if I asked you what are the allowed inputs, you would say all real numbers. But if I gave you this one instead, 1 over x plus 1, well, now you can't say all real numbers, right? What are the allowed inputs? What's the name for that? It's the domain. The allowed inputs are the domain of the function. The set of all possible outputs is called the range. Okay, it's the range. Okay. Um, you could think of it like literally as a, in a gun range, right? The gun range is that place where hopefully the bullets fall, right? It's all possible locations where you know you fire a gun from one end, they fall somewhere else. The range is where they fall. It's all the possible, hopefully, dropping locations for the bullets. Okay. The range. All right, a common way, a common way to represent functions is to do sort of like a bubble diagram. So we'll, we'll say this is a set of numbers like this. One, two, three, four. It's kind of a common thing. This is your domain. And then we'll sort of like make another bubble here and we'll say here's the outputs maybe a set of numbers B and uh, yeah we'll just sort of think about this like uh, a 3 and we'll call this one a 1. A way to represent a function is to connect the dots right remember every function has for a single input just one output so I'll connect this one to that one and I'll connect this 3 to that one that's okay. One goes to just one. Three goes to just one. Maybe I'll also connect two to one, but four will go to three. Okay, for this assignment, one, two, and three all go to one. That's fine. They each only go to one specific thing, each. Four goes to three. That's fine. This is a function. Here's a non-example. Let's send 2 to both 1 
and 3. Okay? Now it's not a function because for one of my inputs, I have two outputs. That makes it not a function. So again, this common way is just to show those assignments, whatever they are. Your inputs or your domain going to your outputs or your range and explicitly linking them with lines. Okay. Another way of representing a function is with a formula. f of x is something. So we're going to have a rule here. We've got a function named f. There's one input, x. The rule for it is square that x and add 4 to it. So when I plug in 1, I get 1 plus 4, which is 5. If I plug in negative 1, this is negative 1 squared, so 1 plus 4, which is 5. If I drew the bubble diagram here, we'd have 1, negative 1. Here's our inputs. And here for our outputs, we apparently have the number 5 so far. Here we go. Is this a function? Yes. For each input, I've given it exactly one output. Okay. And I know exactly how to find that link, right? I plug in an input, I compute what I get out. Okay, so that's with a a nice rule. Another one is a piecewise function. Another way of representing functions is piecewise. And I claim that these things are much, much, much more common than, than the other kind of function I just wrote in everyday things. I think uh, piecewise functions are nicely thought of as um, a kind of function where there's almost a choice made or there's several possible choices to be made um, under certain situations. So I always use the example of getting dressed in the morning, right? It's February, so what do I what do I put on in the morning when I wake up? I put on my pajama pants and a sweatshirt because it's cold, <laughs> right? But what if it was the summertime? I'd put on a pair of shorts and a t-shirt because it's not cold. Right, there's sort of a, there, there is sort of some dependence on the time, right? But then there's a specific output for different, for different times, right? So a piecewise function breaks up the possible inputs. So it partitions breaks up possible inputs into groups. So I'm going to say disjoint sets. So that means there's there's like if you think of the real number line, I can partition it, I can break it up into this set and this set. including this endpoint x0. So I, I can break it up into two disjoint sets. They don't share anything. On the right, we don't include it. On the left, we do include the endpoint. So I can partition the real, in, real line into disjoint sets here. Um, a piecewise function partitions possible inputs into disjoint sets and gives distinct rules for each. Right, so on that number line example, I break up the real lines, and I'm gonna use a number here to, I break up the real line, this is my input set. So let's, let's say this is two. And so for anything to the left of two, I'm gonna say the specific rule for my function is just square the number. 
okay? That's the rule for any x that you pick less than or equal to 2. For any number bigger than 2. I'm going to say just subtract 1. So if you pick a number over here, that's your rule. Square it. That's your output. If you pick a number over here, here's the other rule. You just subtract 1, and that's the output. This is called a piecewise function because it breaks into pieces your possible inputs and uses distinct rules for each. So how is this usually written? Well, I'm going to give a cost example here. So this is the name of the function. C stands for cost. And x is going to be the count, how many, how many things you want to buy. So this is going to be a cost function for how many items you want to purchase. Okay, And I'm using the Home Depot example. <laughs> so you go to Home Depot, right? And if you buy something individually, you're going to spend a certain amount of money. So let me just say $5 times the number of things that you buy. So we'll just say one of them costs 5 bucks. Okay, But there's this nice there's this really nice uh, discount you can get if you buy so many of them. So I'm going to say it's 4.5 times x. So if you, if you buy enough of these things at Home Depot, they give you a discount, 50 cents per item. That's really nice. But they don't do it for everything. So to describe piecewise functions like this, you write the cost you know, the, the, the name of the function, the symbols for the function here, an equal sign, and then you have like a big vertical brace. Okay, and then you just list rules, rule one, rule two, however many possible rules there are, you just start listing them. And then what you do is for each rule, there's a specific set, right, of the number line that you use that rule for So you list right next to each rule uh, the requirements. So at the Home Depot, you, you pay $5 per item if x is less than or equal to, let's say, 50. You have to buy more than 50 things to get the discount. So if x is less than or equal to 50, here's your rule. You pay $5 times the number you buy. But if you buy more than 50, You get the discount and you pay four fifty per item. So the cost is actually a different rule. It's it's calculated using a different rule. So in the general case, you've got this big curly brace, you've listed all the rules, and then you've got requirement one. So whatever that requirement is, requirement two, requirement three. So you've got all these different requirements they need to be separated. You can't have overlap, right? I can't use two rules for the same input. That won't be a function. So the requirements have to have no overlap. But this is a very common situation in life, right? You go to the grocery store, you go to Home Depot, you go to any any place and you, you get in the group discount, right? <laughs> There's different rules for different inputs depending on how big those inputs are or what they are. So piecewise functions are very, very common. Um, and I just wanted to take a time here to talk about those. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about is something called net change. OK, we, we're familiar, I think, with this word net, right? Something like net profit. It's usually used in that sense. Net change. Uh, mathematically, change is calculated using subtraction. If something changes, in order to find how much that changes, you have your final amount minus your starting amount. And generally speaking, this is how you find the net change of something. But in the context of a function, let's say you've got some graph which represents a function. So this is f of x. 
and you want to find the net change from some x value called a over to some other x value called b. How do you find this net change? Well, you're going to take this height, f of b, and you're going to subtract this height, which is f of a. You want to see how much the output has changed. Plugging in a and b gives you those outputs. So f of b is the output for b. f of a is the output for a. So to find the net change of a function, you want to take the final output minus the starting output, and that is your net change. No matter what the function is, this is how you compute it. Take the final minus the initial. This is how net profit is calculated. Okay, you're, you're looking at what your, how much you've made and how much you've spent. And you're doing a simple subtraction. Hopefully it's a positive number. Okay, and, and that's it. Um, I've shown you several ways to represent functions, whether it is a, a, a graph, like, oh, I didn't show you that. Oh, I didn't show you that. So we're not done yet. Functions as graphs. OK. It's a good thing I remember this. This is it's a bit, maybe a bit trickier. So for functions, remember, each input can only have one output. So I could draw a line here. Let me start it there. And let me end it over here. But there is stuff in the middle. If I were to just pick a random x point here, how many heights can be associated with the line which I did not draw yet? If this is a graph of a function, how many heights can be associated with this one input x? The answer is only one. Because a function takes one input and gives one output. Right? One input for every output. Actually, I said that wrong. Each input has only one output. So if I plug in this x, I can't get two possible heights. Height 1, height 2. I can only get one height for that x. So functions do not have branches like this. This is not the graph of a function. Because for all these x's in here, there's actually two heights for every single input. Outside of that shaded area, we're good. Every input has only one output, one height. But in this shaded section, there's two heights for every single input. So this is not the graph of a function. To fix it, it's simple. I just got to erase one of those branches one of those alternative paths. The graph of a function for every possible x has only one possible height. You can't have overlapping parts. OK, so now I've shown you several representations of functions. We've got piecewise, we've got functional, we've got words, right? Those less precise ones that I used at the beginning. Um, uh, you could also make tables of values. Uh, that's another another thing. A table of values is the same as a, a graph, right? This is just all the points. So a table of values. Um, but I hope that helps. Really with this stuff it's just important to, to remember the definition, which is a function for each input can only have one output. That's the most important thing to use when determining if something is a function or is not. And so I hope that helps uh, and I will see you next time for section 2.2 .2, I think. Okay? Until then.